Accelerator will offer speaker events and workshops centered around a particular theme. Our goal is to get our brilliant community thinking about bold policy solutions to today's biggest political problems. This spring, the Innovation Accelerator will culminate in a policy pitch competition for students. This year's theme is justice and citizenship in a time of COVID. In line with this theme, today we will be dis discussing mail-in voting and the 2020 election. My name is Marina Martinez, and I'm a third year dual PhD student in the Stanford School of Public Policy and the Duke Political Science Department. This year, I have the privilege of serving as the Paulus PhD Fellow. Today, I am joined by our two esteemed panelists, Professor Jacob Grumbach and Professor John Aldrich. Jacob Grumbach is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Washington and a faculty associate with, with the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. Grumbach's research focuses broadly on the political economy of the United States with an emphasis on public policy, racial and economic inequality, American federalism and statistical methods. His research has appeared or is forthcoming in the American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, American Journal of Public Health, Business and Politics, Election Law Journal, Journal of Politics, Legislative Studies Quarterly, Perspectives on Politics, and Political Research Quarterly. Previously, Grumbach was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton University. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in 2018. In addition, we also have Duke's very own Professor John Aldrich. John Aldrich is a Pfizer Pratt University Professor of Political Science at Duke University. He specializes in American and comparative politics and behavior, formal theory and methodology. Books he has authored or co-authored include Why Parties, Why Parties Matter, Before the Convention, Linear Probability, Logit and Probit Models, Interdisciplinarity, and a series of books on elections, the most recent of which is Change and Continuity in 2016 and 2018 elections. He has served as co-editor of the American Journal of Political Science. He chaired the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems and continues to serve as chair of the advisory board of the American National Election Study from 2007 to date. He is past president of the Southern Political Science Association, the Midwest Political Science Association, and the American Political Science Association. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow and is a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He received his PhD from Rochester University. Okay. Professor Grumbach and Professor Aldrich, thank you so much for being here with us today. We are so excited to have the both of you. So to kick us off for today's discussion, I wanna start by talking about what voting has looked like prior to 2020. Um, so Professor Aldrich, if you could tell us what voting patterns have looked like in the United States and why Americans turn out to vote or don't turn out to vote. Thank you very much. Uh, very pleased to be here, uh, to be here with friends some old, some new, um, and uh, look forward to the to discussions with, uh, with all of you. Uh, let, me, let me begin by saying that the question of turnout has been uh, a driving force in American elections his, throughout much of its history. Let me just take an example, 1840, uh, this was considered to be the culmination of the first wave of American democracy. Uh, and it was so because turnout had uh, exploded up to 80% uh, of the then current eligible electorate, uh, much higher than we've ever had uh, uh, in, in other elections. It was referred to as the roaring tide of a new democracy. Um, <clears throat> in the end of the 19th century, uh, 50 years later, uh, turnout was the primary focus of campaigning. Uh, they had huge parades uh, torchlight parades at night, uh, and so forth and so on, all designed to generate enthusiasm, get people to turn out to the vote. That's what made the difference in, uh, in the elections. Um, in the current era, we're in exactly the same position. Uh, ca electoral campaigns have become increasingly focused on turnout rather than uh, on trying to get people to change sides as to whom they would, would vote for. This is partially because, as in all three of those periods, there was an unusually big degree of partisan polarization separating and 
with a deep chasm between the two parties. So it was difficult to get people to, from the other side to vote for you. And thus everything hinged on turnout. We can see this in particular in the midterm congressional elections like 2018, 2014, 2010, 2006, like last few midterm congressional elections, the outcome of them was due almost entirely to which party uh, was able to have a stronger turnout effort uh, in that particular election. So 2018 becoming a, con uh, a democratic uh, congressional majority was due to an unusually strong and effective turnout uh, among uh, Democrats in the electorate. So that's that's the sort of history. Uh, the one more thing in the terms of uh, of uh, turnout that I wanted to emphasize is that uh, you and the you the audience of this um, are uh, members of the least participatory uh, age group in um, uh, in in this, um, uh, it, and that's been true as. I mean, I used to be in that age group and I was at the bottom end of, of turnout as well. Uh, uh, nothing special about, uh, about this, uh, but what it means is there's a particular need for people to encourage other people uh, to turn out. And there's a lot of room to increase the turnout, especially among, uh, among the youngest voters. Thank you, Professor Aldrich. So sort of following up on that, if there's all of this wiggle room in voter turnout, what are kind of the most effective ways that politicians, um, fellow citizens have all sort of pushed to increase voter turnout? Yes, um, <clears throat> I would say that the, 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 the biggest single thing that the politicians as candidates do is try to generate uh, enthusiasm. Now that sounds like a positive word. What they're actually typically doing is uh, uh, getting enthusiasm to turn out to defeat the opponent, uh, to vilify the opponent. Uh, very strong negative campaigning seems to be more effective uh, from a candidate's perspective. From a campaign perspective, uh, think obviously this is very different than, it, than any other election with the pandemic. Uh, in a non-pandemic case, it's still the case that door-to-door -door campaigning, meeting people personally and encouraging them to vote is the single most effective strategy that's obviously off the table uh, now. Um, uh, and so that's, that's one thing. Second thing is the change over the last few elections to the ability to micro-target, uh, have, have very good, uh, very good, data on who's registered for which party and so on, and be able to micro-target those individuals. Um, my phone's ringing now, and I'm sure it's yet another. Um, if you happen to hear it in the background, it's I, almost certainly to be somebody's campaign trying to get me to turn out to vote. Um, um, uh, and uh, so that's the, the strategies that are used today. And fortunately for that, it happens to fit uh, the uh, the uh, pandemic dominated era, or at least one campaign, it's hopefully only one campaign. Um, and, the, uh, and, and, but finally, it's the, it's the big data targeting that has uh, been the newest kid on the block in terms of technologies for turnout. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, campaigning is most effective but out the door in a pandemic. And so we're relying a lot on this micro-targeting and use of big data. Do you have any predictions about what that's going to do for a turnout in 2020? Is this going to be like every other election where it's about the same as before, maybe a little bit of fluctuation here and there? Um, or do you think this campaign and this election season is going to be drastically different from what we've seen before? Well, this is going to be drastically different. Um, um, and, but I think it's different in two ways. One of them is with the pandemic and uh, uh, the, the increase in the ability of people to vote by mail, um, this will be a very important, this is, will be, is, it's at, in the middle of uh, this is a very important and very large source of turnout that for, uh, for many people, not for uh, Jacob in his, uh, and in Washington and Oregon, they're used to mail and voting, but for 
us in North Carolina, it's virtually a brand new day. And so we don't have very good under, understanding exactly how it's going to work. The second really big thing, is, I think, is that the things that happened this summer uh, from George Floyd and all the other uh, events that led to um, uh, that led to the social justice campaign, the Black Lives Matter campaign, um, and uh, there, I think it, it's you know it's a sort of different version of negative uh, negative campaign appealing. It's uh, trying to get out to change uh, to change, and so I anticipate an unusually large turnout among African Americans, Latinx, uh, and minorities generally, uh, but probably especially so in uh, among in the African American community. Great, thank you so much. Um, Professor Grumbach, what are your thoughts on what this 2020 election could look like, and uh, especially compared to elections of the past? Thanks. Um, so first, uh, great to be here. Thanks, Marina, for organizing and great to be on here with the legendary Professor Aldrich, who I've learned uh, from in terms of reading over the years and I've never met. And this is a uh, nice to be here. Um, so I'd say in, uh, I'd echo uh, uh, Professor Aldrich's point about the uncertainty about the massive switch to vote by mail here uh, in many states that don't have a history uh, with vote by mail unlike states like Washington State, Oregon, and Colorado, which have all male voting systems, or states like California and others that have uh, sort of partial and large no-fault absentee voting systems. But one issue here to highlight, and my work is a lot about state politics, and it's that constitutionally election administration in the US is done at the state level. The US has a really decentralized federal structure that allows really tremendous policy leeway across the 50 states. Um, but this is especially true in a few policy areas that are concentrated with authority at the state level rather than in the national government. One of which is education policy, things like housing and zoning, um, education policy, mostly uh, state-based as well. Um, but then the big one is election administration, and this goes throughout US history. So when we think about changes in election law and policy about who's allowed to vote, um, ending Jim Crow laws that uh, barred African Americans from voting, especially in the US South, uh, when we think about uh, 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 the, the franchise for women, um, those were initially state laws, right? Eventually the national government came in and said, you can't uh, prohibit women uh, and later African Americans from voting in your state laws. But these are, we have not just one election administration and election law system, we have at least 50, and there's variation among counties as well. So there's really like 3000 uh, election administration systems in the US. That means in a pandemic year like 2020, switching all of these systems to vote by mail is actually really difficult. There's of course controversy about uh, where uh, different political coalitions and actors want more or less strictness uh, or more or less access to mail ballots this year, right? Um, depending on sort of the, the geography, the demographic groups of the voters, things like that. There are battles in the courts about how strict they should be on signature matching the, the mail-in ballot compared to your voter registration signature. Um, those are ongoing uh, uh, legal battles right now. But uh, overall, even when all the administrators at the county and state level want to pursue vote by mail, it's a real challenge to switch a state and local election administration. So New York had a local election this summer that switched to vote by mail very rapidly and they had a huge problem counting the votes and there wasn't a strong uh, uh, long-term habit of voting by mail. So a lot of people filled out the ballots somewhat incorrectly and there was a again, a ton of discussion about how should we uh, count ballots that may have not been put in the security envelope properly and so forth. All of this is, there's a challenge both in terms of ensuring that election administrators, state governments really want people to vote by mail, but then also even when they do, there's this bureaucratic hurdle here. And um, the US decentralized federal structure of election administration makes this a real challenge. And it's really unique around the world, not Many other countries have such different, for example, registration laws. Can you 
Are you automatically registered to vote as you are in uh, New York and Washington state? Are you allowed to vote or to register to vote at the polling place in same day voter registration, right? Which is uh, in some of my research is especially important for turning out young people to vote who often, you know, Gen Z and millennials like to procrastinate, um, don't make that 45 or 60 day uh, sort of deadline prior to election day to register to vote. They change addresses frequently. Uh, same day voter registration uh, seems to be very crucial for young people. Um, but there's just this tremendous variation. And then there's variation in implementation. So we saw recently a move by the Texas Governor Abbott to uh, uh, do an executive order from the governor's office saying counties can only have one mail ballot drop off box per county. Um, and, uh, you know, Harris County with Houston has four or five million people. Then there's some small exurban counties. They all get one one mail drop uh, mail ballot drop off location. Um, and then there's variation in things like whether uh, ex felons are allowed to vote. There's a battle going on about counting, uh, allowing felons to vote in Florida. That's been uh, both through the uh, ballot initiative, then the legislature and now the courts. So overall, just highlighting the tremendous variation and among election administrators across the country and in election policy and how, what a challenge that uh, makes it to switch on a dime during a pandemic to vote by mail. Thank you so much. So digging more into this theme of variation, that variation probably comes from the fact that there are different policy preferences across the United States and across elected officials that sort of leads to this controversy over whether or not to allow vote by mail and how strict to be about ballot matching and things like that. So what are the politics behind this controversy and behind this variation? What is the um, essential political debate that's happening here? That's a great question. So in some of my research, uh, uh, I'm looking at the fact that currently, so Professor Aldrich mentioned, we're in another moment of high polarization across the parties. And this matters tremendously for election policy and administration. Um, uh, and the other thing to think about, it, we're not only in a polarized context, but we're in a very racially polarized context where one party, uh, uh, the vast majority of voters of color, especially black voters vote for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party electoral base is overwhelmingly white. This allows for new abilities of, uh, of political actors, of politicians, state governments, to try to target in different ways, to try to encourage turnout and make it easier to turn out in certain geographic areas where people are likely to vote for them and try to suppress and make it harder to vote in places that are unlikely to vote for them. So this is very concerning uh, when we think about democracy. We want both parties to have incentives to, you know, encourage everyone to participate, to have peaceful transfers of power, to, uh, create a, a, a fair rules across the board so everybody has access to expressing their uh, voice through the ballot and things like that. But right now we're seeing that actually states are polarizing themselves in terms of how easy it is to vote. So some states like Colorado is an example, uh, over the past decade have just made it tremendously easy to vote. They have universal, you get automatically registered to vote when you move to the state, you get mail to mail in ballot, you're allowed to drop it off wherever on a college campus, and you can put it in the mailbox and you can go vote in person and you can register if you're not registered at the polling place. It's tremendously more easy than in uh, some other states and that variation really matters. So in North Carolina, for example, they in the 1990s, they were actually a real innovator and a leader after the National Motor Voter Act, which uh, gave funds for everyone to register at DMVs. And throughout the 90s, you see turnout in North Carolina really skyrocket and it was a really hopeful story. But more recently, there's been some real uh, state pushes to try to diminish voter turnout, especially it appears among, among black voters and voters that are likely to vote for Democrats. So this is very concerning that now there are not only battles over policy, you know, I want a higher tax rate than you or healthcare, in a different uh, insurance uh, policy and things like that. But now there's real some polarization over the fundamental levers of democracy itself, elector the franchise and voting being the primary sort of mechanism there. 
So sort of going off of that, what is the typical justification that is seen for these restrictive voting patterns and what does the research say about the validity of these arguments? That's a great, you got some great questions, Marina. Um, so I would say, uh, so clearly now, if you've been watching the news, the point about uh, expanding access to mail voting, the threat is sort of mail ballot fraud. And the specter of, of voter fraud has been a thing for really a couple decades now, mostly within uh, the Republican coalition and uh, essentially the aligned media sources. So this is a common talking point on Fox News, for example, you can turn on and see concern about uh, uh, electoral fraud, voter fraud. So in-person voter fraud over the years has been audit after audit and study after study. And it's the rates of voter fraud are infinitesimally small. And the times that people are caught, it's quite draconian punishment, uh, prison sentences for voting outside the county in which you live, things like this. Um, more recently, the turn to vote by mail, there's been audits in these long-term vote by mail states like Washington State or Oregon, and they show similarly low rates of mail voter fraud as in-person voter fraud. It's extremely hard to duplicate a mail ballot. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, it's again checked against, uh, uh, you have to be a registered voter to get a mail ballot. They have the security envelope. They're extremely hard to duplicate. Then there's the signature. It actually appears uh, a bit too hard to get your vote counted in uh, most mail ballot states in general. And uh, things like the idea that, so the more recently, the idea that that China or something like that could do mass uh, uh, mail ballot fraud seems just quite uh, implausible. That is, at the same time, this has helped that sort of specter has helped polarize uh, to some extent, voters in their beliefs about mail voting. So for the most part, most polls show super majorities of Americans across parties, um, including, you know, Republican voters support mail voting policies and mail voting in general and believe it's safe. But there is some growing polarization among voters in their beliefs about the fairness and uh, sort of security of mail ballots as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, for my last like mail voting specific question, you recently were working on a paper that I got to see you present a few weeks ago on the impacts of mail-in voting. Could you tell us a little bit about your findings from that paper? Absolutely. Um, so uh, we joined a couple other uh, papers that look at the partisan effects of vote by mail that find that they're, uh, historically vote by mail policies haven't benefited one party over the other. This year, this is all very uncertain with all these uh, uh, states moving to vote by mail very quickly and the new sort of polarization around mail voting uh, from you know Trump tweets and things like that. But uh, historically, it hasn't benefited one party over the other, though that's not the best criteria to judge an election policy. It's probably best to just say whatever makes it easier for anyone to vote regardless of their partisanship and whatnot. However, there hasn't been partisan effects so far. Our paper focuses on the particular demographic groups that turn out under vote by mail. And the conventional wisdom is young people and uh, especially new immigrant groups, Latino and Asian voters were not that enthusiastic about vote by mail. That was a sort of old theory over the past generation of political scientists. And the idea there was that young people get really hyped around election day and going in person. Professor Aldrich mentioned this uh, enthusiasm, right? Young people like that hype and that's getting a ballot at home and filling it out seems more boring and doesn't have that sort of fanfare about it. But we found that in states that switched to uh, uh, all male voting, young it actually benefited young people at least as much as everyone else. In some cases like Colorado, it appears they were the main beneficiaries. Youth turnout really skyrocketed over this time period. It's hard to disentangle the effect of registration laws, like I mentioned. So automatic and same day voter registration are hugely important for young people. And those tend to go on along with expansions of mail voting. But in general, uh, uh, we show that all demographic groups benefit in turnout, um, but especially young voters. And it's probably just a large part due to the point Professor Aldrich made about young voters turn out the least. Um, but just doubling down on that, it's critical that young people turn out to vote um, uh, it's 
the US uh, sort of political policy outcomes heavily favor older Americans compared to other wealthy democracies in terms of how, where spending goes to, uh, things like this. There's a reason for that, and that youth turnout in the US is very low. Um, so, you know, if you're in Gen Z, I'm an old millennial, we had some okay, uh, uh, our turnout is improving as we get older. Gen Z uh, is still low voter turnout, but some really encouraging political mobilization around all sorts of issues, uh, police brutality, gun control, uh, climate change, really exciting. Um, uh, so it's important to turn out to vote in Gen Z, even though your music is not as good as older generations music. Thank you so much for that hopeful note. Um, Professor Aldrich to you, I sort of want to pivot to the future of voting. So we've talked a lot about mail-in voting and what things could potentially look like in 2020, but what role do you see mail-in voting uh, playing beyond 2020? So I, I, assuming that it works out even really reasonably okay, I think it's going to be uh, uh, a wave of the future that we're going to be make this will be an opportunity that will be av made available whether it will become the way to vote or not is less clear uh, but I think it'll be it'll be, become real popular with the public if it works well and if it does uh, then it'll it will expand and that will be uh, uh, helpful the <clears throat> Uh, it would also be extremely helpful if the if it turned out that over over time the evolution of the partisan coalitions uh, would would be somewhat more balanced and less less divided on this um, come to a consensus that uh, we are a democracy citizens are sovereign uh, they uh, it is really it, it is a, a, a requ requisite of government uh, to uh, make it as feasible as possible to, to cast it for everyone who is potentially eligible to be able to cast their one and as a nod to the Republicans, their one and only vote uh, uh, as uh, with it as low cost and as low hassle and as low difficulty as possible. Um, as Professor Gumber was saying, the, the, I mean, you know, in North Carolina yesterday, our voting laws were just changed. We had a court decision um, and uh, uh, some aspects of uh, compromise that was struck between the two parties was, uh, was sundered. And now they have to redo some of the mail-in voting. So this is, it, it is quite chaotic now. Um, and, and the kind of decision that was reached in our state would be, would be extremely different in Iowa or or, or someplace else. Um, if I, if it were to come to pass it, Joe Biden, the Democrats in the Senate, Democrats in the House were able to uh, form majorities and pass one thing, I would take take a look at the second article of the Constitution, where it says uh, the states shall determine the manner of election unless the Congress chooses otherwise. Uh, and I would take that and, and what I would do is say, uh, these are the rules that we want, that we want to insist upon. We're going to mandate to cover federal elections, House, Senate, presidential electors. Um, states will go along with those uh, if you require them to automatically be registered, to uh, make election day a holiday to uh, all the variety of things that have been proposed to ease uh, registration. Uh, I mean, uh, turn out generally registration and voting uh, and uh, look for systems that make it, um, instead of voters having to opt into the system, have them opt out. And we know from behavioral economics that that makes a huge difference, a small thing that makes a huge difference in participation rates. Thank you so much. So those are some pretty big changes. And um, I know that there are changes that exist in other democracies in the United States. Um, so what evidence do we have um, comparatively that could uh, potentially illuminate what the effect of these big changes could have on turnout in the US? Yes, uh, there's not a whole lot, of, I don't think, on mail-in, although Australia has, has it. Of course, they have mandatory 
voting uh, and you are fine. And sometimes you actually, they actually implement it uh, if you're not. So that is certainly a way that gets turnout to uh, increase. Um, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, what we know is from, we're, we're, there's only one other nation and that's Switzerland that votes at a rate, anything comparable to the United States among our relative comparison group of, uh, you know, uh, advanced demo uh, economic, economic democracies. Uh, we're well behind, um, uh, although in my comparative things, I hadn't spent most of my life uh, being teased and, and uh, about how, how bad voting rates are in the United States. I have been in the fortunate position to say, oh, you know, they're really declining in Canada and in Britain. You're, we're, we're finally catching, you're catching up to us. Um, but that's, that's, so there is a re removal of uh, the electorates around the world, which is important, but they start at such a much higher level. It's very much like 1840, they're at the higher level. Every, every other place has more or less uh, automatic or, or government uh, run registration. Uh, most have a very easy um, either a holiday, election, election day is a holiday or it's on a weekend. So it eases that up. Um, you know, people are, are in many ways turned off in, by such things as uh, the redistricting we do, the gerrymandering. Um, virtually no other country has that. There's a, uh, there's a, a, a district, a commission that does it in essentially nonpartisan uh, way if they have districts at all. Um, and so all of these things that taint the electoral system. Our problem is that the constitution said that the people we elect to offices are in charge of their own electoral system. They get to write their own laws. Um, and, uh, and, and over time, these accumulate such that they uh, help the incumbents um, and make it harder, uh, make it harder for other parties make it harder for citizens generally to participate in politics. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Grumbach, what are your thoughts on the future of voting? We've proposed some big changes today, so um, yeah. have any no, My neck is gonna be hurting from nodding so hard, mm -hmm. but the point there of, uh, so there is currently what's called the Federal Elections Commission is an agency in the federal government, but that actually regulates campaign finance and money in politics rather than, uh, you know, access to voting. So something like a federal elections administration that is has independent appointments, the way these independent districting commissions and other countries do, uh, sort of election administration through uh, sort of nonpartisan experts and administrators come in and determine sort of. Uh, uh, even handed rules, that would be really crucial. And the way federalism typically works when the national government wants states to do something, it usually uses money um, by either threatening to take money away. So this was actually the case in implementing something like the Americans with Disabilities Act where uh, state and local uh, governmental buildings had to put in uh, disabled entrances and things like that. Um, uh, if you don't implement this, then uh, other forms of national funding are pulled. Um, this was uh, also true in terms of ending Jim Crow laws and things like that. But there is one. So if the national government, there are things that the federal government, the national government in Washington, D.C. can do. One is the Election Day holiday where you can make it a federal holiday. Um, another is to create this administrative agency that uh, provides or or uh takes away funding based on things like, you know, everybody should be automatically registered to vote if you're eligible and a resident adult resident in the state, for example, or if the state, uh, uh, the state should not be allowed to disenfranchise those who are previously incarcerated and uh, all these sorts of things are possible. Um, this doesn't look uh, all that viable in the current context of the national government, both in terms of uh, the presidency at the moment, but also the Supreme Court, which uh, in recent years, uh, I, I can't remember the exact, was it 2013, I believe, was they uh, ruled unconstitutional Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the first sort of bulwark, which is the pre-clearance pre provision saying that if states, former 
especially uh, formerly Jim Crow states, if they want to change their election laws in major ways that may affect how easy it is for especially uh, racial minorities to vote, they have to check with the US Justice Department in Washington, DC. Um, they removed that and then we saw a wave of sort of restrictive voting laws like voter ID laws. It looks like if this current trend of the Supreme Court continues, they may further uh, uh, sort of uh, dismantle the Voting Rights Act and allow states to do even uh, greater, have either greater, greater variation across states based on what the state government, how easy the state government wants it for people to vote. Um, right now, this is really a concern with seeing in the first day of early voting, some people waiting 11 hours in line. Like that is absolutely astounding. And regardless of, you know, part of that may be because as Professor Aldrich mentioned, this is probably going to be a high turnout election for a number of reasons. Polarization, uh, this is a unique, there are so many unique uh, sort of uh, uh, political crises and socioeconomic problems and so many things that are turning out people to vote, plus a tremendous amount of affective polarization, negative polarization where people really dislike, you know, really dislike people who vote for the other team uh, and this probably matches, we don't have great psychological evidence from a long time ago, but it probably matches any time in American history, this sort of antipathy, but that causes some increase in turnout. Regardless, it is just, uh, it's an international embarrassment to have somebody wait that long in line to uh, exercise their right to vote. Um, so in the future, I think uh, 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 trends towards vote by mail will increase. Um, there's uh, something to be said about habituating to this new system and then people, it becomes more entrenched, people are used to it and people in vote by mail states have tended to like it. Um, and sort of everyone voters in these vote by mail states and their election administrators at the county and state level all seem to report that this works pretty well. They get better at counting the votes, but right now this is going to be quite the moment this uh, in terms of uh, this November ballot counting where uh, this is going to be a major difference and everybody, uh, everybody who's sort of a, a civic actor right now from journalists to academics to ordinary voters should be aware of, you know, how different and uncertain this is looking in terms of both court cases around counting mail ballots, but also in just counting themselves. So we're used to having an election decision the night we all go and like join and have cake and watch election night coverage. And they say at like some point in the evening, this is the new president elect. But this time it may actually take uh, as long, if not longer than the 2000 election based on not only that litigation I mentioned, but even just counting the mail ballots themselves where states that haven't moved to mail balloting before may count the in-person ballots first then the mail ballots uh, may be counted over the ensuing days, if not weeks. Um, and with the signature matching on mail ballots, it can be like snail's pace slow. Um, and so there's uh, just, everyone should really be aware, unless there's some extreme landslide on election night, there's a very strong chance we won't know who the president elect is. And this makes it uh, an especially vulnerable moment for politicians, political actors and parties and the media to kind of mess this up by uh, suggesting somebody won early on when we haven't counted anywhere near the total number of ballots that have come in. But uh, so we all we should all take a breather and uh, try to be as sort of zen as possible in those days, knowing that this may take a bit. Thank you so much. So I'm going to use this discussion we've just had about all of these different um, sort of policy proposals or overhauls to voting as we know it in the United States to sort of segue into our audience Q&A. So we proposed, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about um, making voting by mail more accessible, a federal oversight committee to standardize election rules across the US, automatic voter registration, election day is a holiday. So all of these big changes are definitely gonna change the way that elections are run and the way that we as citizens perceive elections. Um, so let's talk about it in terms of election integrity. Um, what do we mean when we say election integrity? And what are the impacts of these big changes on our election integrity? Um, Professor Aldrich, wanna start with you? Thank you, yes. Uh, 
integrity is a good thing to think about. Um, uh, it basically means the securing of the uh, actual uh, balloting process itself. Um, we think about 2016 and the threats to electoral integrity. Some of them were there. Uh, you know, we tend to, to, to glom more so on the Russian use of social media to try to change people's opinions. Um, that's a distinctive this, an incredibly important and difficult to deal with issue, but it's really distinctive, distinct from the electoral process. Um, one of the sources of the difficulties that have cropped up, uh, not only are there 50 and, and there's actually more because individual states sometimes allow variation within uh, uh, areas in their in their county as, as Professor Gump, in their counties as Professor Gump I noted. Um, but uh, the, um, the simply a lack of funding uh, to create the technology uh, of just the simple technology of casting a vote and counting it. Um, just just those things. Um, uh, and to develop them in a ways that are um, uh, uh, fail-proof as much as you can make them. I mean, nothing is ever fail-proof, but go as close as you can to, uh, to, to do that. So, so it's gonna take money. And this is, another, this is where the federal government could uh, take a big step. They had sort of talked about it after 2000. They did a little bit, uh, but, but nowhere near the amount of uh, 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 the amount that was anywhere near necess necessity. And since then, of course, the technologies of the world have changed so dramatically um, uh, that and, and, and voting has not caught up with it. So I would start with the integrity of the uh, of the vote itself, how, how to get it safely to the voter, from the voter to uh, to a place to be counted. Um, and then by integrity, that means uh, just sealing off the process so it's secure and people can feel pretty confident that uh, that they can cast a vote and that it will indeed be counted. Thank you, Professor Grumbach, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I love the way Professor Aldrich split that into two. So multiple different sort of conceptual areas of integrity. So the first is this totally uncertain world of uh, now the rise of big data and targeting and sort of concerns about privacy and all of this that we actually don't have good legal precedent for. And we don't really even know philosophically what is right and wrong in this case. So for example, we do know that leak of the Cambridge Analytica data, remember that Facebook acts, uh, not accidentally, whatever, it was an illegal uh, sort of sharing of people's personal data that allowed for really effective targeting of, of sort of persuasion content to try to get different people to turn out and uh, keep make different people less enthusiastic. That probably matters on the margin uh, uh, a bit. And 2016 was an extremely close election. So there are many, many causes for uh, why a close election could have swung the other way and things like that. Um, but we actually don't even know sort of philosophically how bad that it, you know, it's not illegal at this point to try to target people um, based on their, you know, the type of magazines they read and their commercial behavior and their, you know, what advertisers know and try to target them with a message that might be persuasive to them. That's legal and, you know, seems not great, you know, dubious. And we need a lot of thinking from folks who are steeped in technology like you all to help us determine like what should the boundaries be in terms of technology and targeting and big data and privacy issues? Should Alexa be allowed to listen to your conversation and then send you a political ad? Uh, there's a ballot initiative in California now uh, regulating Uber gig workers, right? To make them formally employees rather than contractors. And if you have Uber on your phone, it sends you push messages all the time. And when you try to get an Uber ride, it says, are you gonna vote the right way on Prop 22? If you want an Uber ride, you better press yes. Like that, it actually does. This is a brave new world. Very soon we're gonna have smart TVs where the advertisement, a political advertisement, to skip through it, it'll say something 
you'll actually have to physically say the words like, I'm going to vote for John Smith. And then it'll skip the act. Like this will be coming soon. Um, and this sort of the legal terrain of that is going to be an open playing field for you all to engage in. But that's so that's one issue. A second issue is the formal voting laws, whether states allow all male voting, whether elections a holiday or not, same day voter registration, automatic voter registration. And we hope that can trends towards greater access. And that's de jure policy, like actual legal policy on the books. Then there's another uh, element of implementation uh, where uh, election administrators, again, have tremendous leeway to make it easier or more costly to vote. So how many mail ballot drop boxes are there going to be? Um, uh, things like uh, how long early voting is open for, uh, uh, how many polling places, where polling places, precincts are, are located and things. This is done by administrators, um, bureaucrats. So, and uh, at times that can be legally kind of dubious. Um, so for example, the rise of like fake uh, mail ballot drop-off locations that just happened in California. There was an order from this, California Secretary of State to cease and desist, but it's unclear like whether that violates a real de jure law. Like this is all hazy implementation of law, right? The execution of law. So there's three elements there uh, that we got to look about going forward. One is sort of technology, political advertising, get out the vote and sort of new concerns about big data and privacy. A second is the actual formal state laws around who's allowed to vote and uh, how easy it is. And then there's this issue of implementation. On all of those, there's gonna be major battles going forward. Um, and uh, the Democratic Congress, the US House that came in in 2018 or was elected in 2018, their first bill is this big democracy reform bill. So it's now an issue. And you see the rise of like Stacey Abrams's group. Uh, I think it's called Fair, but I forget, but uh, you just see, this is now an issue that voters and activists are really talking about in a way that I, in my younger days, like we didn't see people discussing when you asked, why are you, why do you like this party, not that party? Why are you turning out to vote? People would say issues, healthcare, taxes, war and peace, um, you know, the environment, uh, you know, abortion, something like that. Now, more people are saying democracy policies, which is a, a fascinating moment we're in. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question from our audience. And someone sent in, um, with regard to curbside drive through voting, do you think this is an approach that will expand voting? Professor Aldrich, do you want to start? Yeah, I, uh, I, um, I, I don't know whether it'll, there's a lot of these laws that it's not that uh, necessarily that it's going to increase, but um, because that's in some ways people's choices, but I think curbside voting uh, drop off is a, is, a, is a nice way. You, you wanna make it as easy as possible so that if people, some, somebody who, who doesn't vote is because they chose not to vote, not because they couldn't figure out how to vote uh, or because they were barred from voting in some way. And so all of these things that make it seamless uh, for the individual um, are designed to be a, a whole fabric. I mean, the number of things that we've mentioned here today, and, and this will be one of them that would, uh, that would uh, make things, uh, you know, just, just, much more convenient and therefore uh, it reduces the annoyance costs that lead people to not vote. And uh, then we're left with the annoyance cost that we have to pick one of these two guys. Thank you, Professor Aldrich. Professor Grumbach, any thoughts? Yeah, no, yeah. So it, I think this is another place where it might vary by geography. So in my trips to North Carolina, like there's a, a lot of great drive through food and things like that. And it's a, a you know, I love picking up my barbecue and driving through. And then in Seattle, it's a somewhat car city, but not quite as much. Um, and I imagine they would implement drive through voting less so, at least in the denser parts of, for example, Seattle or in, uh, 
in denser in New York City or something like that. Um, so I think, yeah, that's going to vary. But I hadn't really thought of that. It could be cool to drive through and uh, and uh, drop off your ballot. That would be a that might be a fun experience that would combine distant voting with the fanfare, people playing their music out of their cars and honking maybe. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so, so much to our panelists and our attendees for being here with us today. Um, this was a wonderful conversation. I learned so much. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us. Also, thank you to the Paulus Center for Politics for sponsoring today's event. So hopefully you are super excited to vote this year, whether by mail or in person. Um, so in order to help you out, Paulus is also sponsoring a ballot party on Monday, October 19th via Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. So this event is really geared towards people who are first-time voters in Durham County, North Carolina. There's a ton of undergraduate students who are super excited to be voting in their first presidential election or voting for the first time in North Carolina. And so we really want to make sure that these voters are as informed as they possibly can be. So during this ballot party, we'll be going over the three ways that you can vote in North Carolina, and we'll be going over the ballot in Durham County, North Carolina to make sure that everyone knows what they're voting for. Um, so please spread the word to your students, to your friends, to your colleagues who uh, might benefit from this event. Um, and a reminder that today is also the first day of early voting in North Carolina. So hopefully you're jazzed about voting and you're going to go wait in that 11 hour line today and um, cast your ballot. So thank you so much to everyone for being here with us today. Um, and I think that'll do it for today's event. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.